If you have the Calvary Ministries mobile app on your phone, open it up right now to the page labeled Today's Sermon. Scroll halfway down to the thing that says Personal Notes. If you don't have that mobile app open, take your paper worship guide and grab a pen or a pencil right now. I want to invite you to write down six words. Go ahead and grab a pen or a pencil right now. Pencil, you don't have a pen, just dive in the purse of the lady next to you. She's got six of them in there. Just grab something to write this down with. I want to ask everybody in this room, write this down on your mobile device. Write it down on your worship guide. Here's six words that I want you to write down. Are you ready? First three words. Finish the mission. Write those three words down. Now write these words, these three words down. In our lifetime, exclamation mark. Finish the mission in our lifetime. Here's what those three words are, or those six words are communicating to you. What you just saw on that video is that we are the first generation in human history Calvary Baptist Church and Jesus' Church Universal is the first generation in history that has the ability to finish the mission of God. We call the mission of God the Great Commission. We can finish this in our lifetime. And if we can finish the mission of God in our lifetime, we must finish the mission of God in our lifetime. And if we don't, we're the only ones to blame for it. It's not God's fault. So if you're new to Calvary Baptist Church, it doesn't matter if you've been around here for six days or if you've been around here for 60 years, let me tell you about this church. This church exists to do one thing. It was up there on that screen just a second ago. It's called the Great Commission. The Great Commission is found in Matthew chapter 28. We're not going to turn there. You saw it up there on the screens. But you can summarize that entire statement, Matthew 28 verses 19 and 20, into only two words. If you've been around here before, you've heard me say this. Don't let me down, church. What are the two words that communicate everything you need to know about the Great Commission? Say it out loud. Thank you for saying the two words that this church exists for, to make disciples. Today, I'm going to start three weeks over the month of March describing for us not just what are we supposed to be doing as a church, but how are we going to do that? You have three words that are on the screens. I'm going to give you some Calvary Baptist Church math today. First sermon today, here's the three sermons during the month of March. First sermon today, reach out to three people that don't know Jesus Open your life up to them, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, maybe they'll become followers of Jesus. Reach three people. Next week's sermon, build into one person. Go really deep with one person and build into that one person until they're trained up and ready to go and ready to go do this with three more people. And then the third sermon in this series Send that one person out. You and that one person go out and you start doing with this, with this with other people until you become two unstoppable people for the kingdom of God. Here's the entire sermon series for three weeks. Reach, build, and send. You know where we're going for the rest of this month and this is describing how we're going to do that. Now, I want everyone in the room to understand when we talk about making disciples, we're describing today not just what are we going to do, but we're describing over the next three weeks these three words, how are we doing that as a church? How is any church, not just our church, any church supposed to be doing that? But here's what sets the stage for this whole sermon series. Here's what sets the stage for everything that you're going to hear from me today. Everyone, I am convinced Everyone in the Chattahoochee Valley, everyone in America, everyone on planet Earth deserves to hear what Jesus Christ did for them 2,000 years on, ago on the cross. Everyone deserves to hear it. The problem is many people are stuck in this swamp of sin and they don't have that message because nobody's come to them and shared that message with them. Nobody's reached out to them right where they are. Everyone deserves to hear what Jesus did for them. 
until there's nobody else left to tell. That's when the mission has been finished, and I'm convinced we can do it in our lifetime. Now, what we're going to do for the next few moments is we're going to talk about the people that are not here today. Let's just talk bad about them for a few minutes. You want to? Here's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about people that don't go to church, don't know Jesus, have no real interest in what we're doing in this room today. And if you look at those banners on the outside of our worship center, on the welcome center out there, on the left and right of that fountain, you will see what we're describing for you today is the overwhelming majority of the Chattahoochee Valley. This is 60, 70, probably more like 80% of the people that live in our neighborhoods. This is where they live. And I'm going to give you four statements that the Bible makes that will help you describe what it's like before somebody introduces you to Jesus. What is life like if you don't know Jesus Christ personally? These four statements come naturally out of the Bible. They're found in your mobile app under the Today's Sermon page. Here's the first statement. If you've got that paper worship guide, write this down. People that don't know Jesus personally don't go to church. And we can call them unchurched. We can call them de-churched, meaning mom and dad took them to church when they were a child. But the second that they got a chance to stop going, when mom and dad stopped making them go, they checked out of church altogether and they want nothing to do with it. Folks that aren't here today because they don't want to be here today, and some wish they could, but they're not. They can't. The folks that aren't here today because they don't want to be here, they're spiritually clueless. Now, I want you to ex understand what this phrase means. I'm not saying that they're atheists. There are a few atheists in our community, but very few. Most of these folks that we're talking about today are very spiritual people. They are hungry and they're longing for something. They just don't know what the answers are, which is what makes them clueless. I'm not saying just that they're clueless. I'm saying that they're both spiritual and clueless at the same time, which makes them spiritually clueless. So we have to help them understand something, explain something to them that they've never heard before, or maybe it's just never sank in before. Here's what the Bible refers to these people who don't know Jesus personally. Here's how spiritually clueless they are. Romans chapter 10, starting in verse 14. How then can they call on him? The they in this verse are people that don't know Jesus personally, stuck in this swamp of sin. And the him in this verse is referring to Jesus. How can they call on him they have not believed in. And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news, but not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? And here's the summary of this passage. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Jesus Christ. I love this verse because it's so simple. Here's what it says. People don't know and they don't believe because they don't understand, and they don't understand because nobody has gone to them and helped them understand, and how can somebody go to them and help them understand unless they're sent as a preacher it's saying, of course people are spiritually clueless. They're clueless because nobody's helped them understand the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done for them. Now, I owe it to you to tell you, you go out there and look at those banners. You check out Russell and Lee County, Alabama. You go out there and see the spiritual condition of Harris and Muskogee County, Georgia, and you're going to see a lot of people in our community fit this verse right here. And you're probably thinking to yourself, Jeff, there is a church on every corner. They can just get up and go to church if they want to hear about Jesus. Yeah, they can, but they're not going to because that's not the age that we live in anymore. That was the way our country functioned 50 years ago, but we don't function like that anymore. People don't get up and go to church to get answers. It's time for us to bring the answers to them. But I want to go back to something that you just saw in the Bible a second ago. See this word preacher? Don't make the mistake. This is not the office of pastor. 
In fact, it's a very different word the Bible is using here than pastor or the preacher that we use in our vocabulary today. Here's what this word literally means in the New Testament. It means a herald, somebody who just explains the news. If you were to ask what's a modern day equivalent of this word, it would be a news broadcaster. And basically, a preacher is anybody who's explaining the good news, just making public what they already have heard or what they're already aware of. You see, the whole system in Romans chapter 10 is based on this. If you don't go preach, nobody can understand the truth, and nobody's going to follow Jesus if nobody is going and nobody is preaching. And the preaching that we're talking about is just simply telling people what Jesus did inside you. That's what it means to be a herald or a messenger of the good news. Now, I almost did this today, look up on the screens. I almost asked everybody in the first service, hey, take your shoes and socks off and put your feet in front of the person next to you. I want them to see your feet because the Bible is saying for us today, it is beautiful, the feet of somebody who came to you and brought you the good news. But I'll be honest with you, anybody who is sharing their faith with somebody else, anybody who has been part of a miracle of God, God used you to take some man or some woman from dead in sin to alive in Christ, you know exactly what this verse means. Because most of us who have been part of this process have had the thrill of seeing somebody bow their knees and surrender their soul to Jesus Christ. And being part of that process is almost as awesome as the moment you bowed your knees and you surrendered your soul to Jesus Christ. It's awesome to be a messenger of the good news, to be a preacher with beautiful feet, sharing with somebody else your story of what Jesus has done for you. What I'm trying to tell you from the Bible today is We that know Jesus Christ personally, we have an obligation to tell people who don't know Jesus about him. This is what we mean as a church by reaching out and by sharing the message of Jesus. Because here's the truth. Not only are people that don't know Jesus spiritually clueless, they've actually been lied to. They've been tricked. And here's the lie. You, you, if you get, uh, practice regularly sharing your faith. You're going to hear this because some people around us believe, well, I I believe in God, but I believe that God is a good God and he wouldn't ever send somebody to hell. I mean, a good God would never do that, right? Or they'll say something like this. Maybe God sends people to hell, but he only sends the worst people there like Osama bin Laden, um, Adolf Hitler. Those guys are going to hell. But I'm a pretty good person. I'm going to go to heaven because I'm not nearly as bad as those people. And when you get involved in a discussion with them, the discussion is going to, here's the lie that they end up believing. The discussion is going to end up sounding something like this. I'm a pretty good person. My good deeds are going to outweigh my bad deeds at the end of my life. And because I have more good deeds than bad deeds, God is going to let me into heaven because of my good deeds, right? Right? Those of you in this room who know the Bible, is that accurate? No. That is a lie straight from Satan that will send somebody directly to the pit of hell. Here's what the Bible teaches. There's no amount of good deeds. You do one bad deed one time and for the rest of your life do nothing but good deeds, it doesn't outweigh the bad. Somebody is going to have to die for the bad deeds that you've done. Those are called sin and the payment for sin is death. That's the only acceptable payment. So now who's going to die on your behalf? You or somebody else. You or Jesus. And most people who don't know Jesus personally have been tricked into believing this lie. If I'm better at the end of my life, if I've done more good than bad, certainly God's going to let me into heaven, right? That lie will cause people to end up directly in the pit of hell. That lie is what's described for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. These people that have been tricked into believing a lie, here's what the Bible says. Therefore, since we, the people who know Jesus personally, therefore, since we have this ministry, because we were shown mercy, we don't give up. Instead, we have renounced secret and shameful things, not acting deceitfully or distorting the word of God, but commending ourselves 
before God to everyone's conscience by an open display of the truth. You see what the Bible is saying? Lots of people don't understand the truth. They've been tricked. And in fact, the Bible will describe how they've been tricked in verse 3. But if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, look at it on the screens. The God of this age has tricked them. He's lied to them. He's blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For we are not proclaiming ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of, of God's glory in the face of Jesus Christ. The Bible is saying here, when we go talk to people, we're not talking about us. We're here to talk to them about Jesus. And a really powerful way to do that is to just simply say what Jesus has already done inside of us. And not only has he done that inside of us, but he can do it for them too. This is just sharing your story and telling people how Jesus has changed you. Your story is very powerful because no one can look at you in the eyes and say, that never happened. They may not believe it can happen to them, but they can't look you in the face and say, yeah, that never happened to you. That's one of the things that makes this story so powerful. That's why 2 Corinthians says, when we go talk to people, we're not committing ourselves. We're not making ourselves look good. No, we're going to talk to people to make Jesus look good. We're to commend Jesus. The Bible describes this as a ministry of reconciliation. It's reconciling sinful man to a holy God, and that is only possible through the death of Jesus. And that's the ministry that we've been given by God. And we've been given it because he showed us mercy. He's given us grace. And he wants us to show mercy and give grace to people that are in need. And you do this by proclaiming. If you don't proclaim, nobody hears. Now, I almost didn't use this passage today because there's been some really bad teaching that's infiltrated Jesus' church for hundreds of years. And this passage is where some of those, that train is derailed. It actually started a long time ago with a Catholic priest by the name of Francis of Assisi. And one of the things that St. Francis of Assisi said is preach always, when necessary, use words. Hey, I get where he's coming from. In fact, I totally understand the thought behind this phrase, but he's wrong. That's not what the Bible is teaching. What Francis is saying is you're supposed to show people by the way that you live that Jesus is real, that he really has cleaned you up, that he really has changed you. Of course, people need to see that, but it's not good enough just to see it. You also need to say it. And where this thing went wrong is many people believed, well, if I just show people that Jesus is my Savior, they'll stumble into Christianity. They'll just kind of fall into it face forward. That's not what the Bible is teaching. It's saying, show it and say it. Show people that Jesus is real because he's changed your life. But you also have to proclaim it. You also have to say it. You also have to make it very clear. Here's what I would tell Francis. Preach always and always use words, but use your life at the same time. You see, people that don't know Jesus, people that don't care about Jesus, they, they're spiritually clueless. They don't, they don't know because nobody's explained it to them. And they've been tricked into believing a lie. But here's another thing that's true about them. They are primed, and ready. They're low-hanging fruit in the orchard, ready to be plucked. And somebody just needs to go to them and to explain the message to them. This is not a program at Calvary Baptist Church. This is just you naturally going through your day and sharing who Jesus is, opening your life up and sharing who Jesus is with people that are part of your circle already. By the way, this is how Jesus told his disciples to go do uh, the Great Commission. In Matthew chapter 9, he was sending them out and he reminded these disciples, hey, 
God is already at work in front of you. He's already preparing people's hearts ahead of time. And you may not even possibly understand how they've been longing and struggling and wanting answers. And when you show up, God's already got them ready. All you need to do is be faithful to explain the message. Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38. Then Jesus said to his disciples, the harvest is abundant but the workers are few. The harvest that Jesus was talking about are people's souls. And he said, they're ready, they're willing, they're waiting. The problem is there's not enough workers going out into the vineyard, into the orchard to harvest the work that God is already doing. Verse 38, therefore pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. In Jesus' day, this was supposed to be very normal, very natural. As you go to work, as you're going to school, when you're hanging out with your hunting buddies, when you're going to the gym with the ladies, just share with them what Jesus has already done for you and just share it very naturally. And by the way, don't be surprised when they ask you how they can have that too. Because God's been working in their heart, maybe for weeks or months or years, and you're the first person ever to answer some questions that they've been looking for for a long time. And then you have the privilege of seeing them bow their knee and surrender their soul to Jesus Christ. God's already doing this in their life. You're not doing it. He's doing it. It's the Holy Spirit that's already working. And your job, my job, is to just go out there and to be faithful to share the message. Just Reach out to the people that are already in your life. Because here's the bottom line. When you do this, by the power of the Holy Spirit, I'm 100% convinced they'll listen to your story. Look at what it says on the screen. I didn't say that they will all receive Christ. In fact, that's not what the Bible teaches. But every one of them will listen. And some of them, I am convinced, will become followers of Christ if you'll just simply share your story. In the Bible, there's this extreme case of racism. It's the Jews that absolutely hate, these Jews in the South absolutely hate a race of people from the North called the Samaritans. They hate these people more than they hate the Roman Empire that's oppressing them. And the Jews want nothing to do with the people that live north of them in this land of Samaria. So in John chapter 4, Jesus decides to tell the disciples, hey, pack up a lunch. We're going to take a road trip and we're going to go up north and we're going to go to Samaria. And when he gets up there, Jesus sends his disciples to go buy some food, and it's hot. Jesus is thirsty. He goes and sits down by a well in this town of Samaria. And a woman from town comes to sit down by the well. Jesus just simply starts to have a natural conversation with her. And the conversation goes from talking about water and talking about this well to talking about worshiping God. And in the process, this woman, this Samaritan woman, becomes a Christian. Now, I want you to notice what she does next. Look, best that we know, she's been a Christian for 15 minutes. And she goes back and she starts telling people in town about Jesus. Did you hear what I just said? I mean, she doesn't know any Bible answers. She hasn't memorized any scripture. She doesn't have a whole plan of salvation memorized in the back of her mind. She's just so fired up about what Jesus did for her. She wants everybody else in town to know what Jesus did for her. John chapter 4, starting in verse 39, it's fascinating what the Bible says about that town because of this woman. Here's what the Bible says. Now many Samaritans from that town believed in him, Jesus, because of what that woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. Let me pause for just a second. They haven't met Jesus personally. They've never heard that man preach. They've never had a chance to see him heal the sick. But this woman goes back to her neighborhood and she starts telling people what Jesus did. And many people, verse 39, come to faith in Jesus because of this woman who's been a Christian for about 15 minutes at this point. And here's why. 
they're seeing a miracle happen right before their very eyes because they know this woman. They know the kind of lifestyle that she's lived. And now they're seeing in front of her, that's radically different. Something happened to her. Maybe it can happen to me too. And people start to believe in Jesus before they've even seen him with their own eyes because this woman is just simply sharing her own story with them. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, verse 40. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there for two days. And look at what the Bible says. Many more believed because of what Jesus said. Verse 42, and they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that it, this really is the Savior. Look at what it says on the screens. Not the Savior of the Jews. Not just the Savior of a small group of people. This is the Savior of the Samaritans. This is the Savior of every race and every nation and every color of skin. We just realized that guy's here for us too. And we realized that because this lady who had known Jesus for about 15 minutes started to do what's just natural after you give your life to Jesus. You just want to tell everybody how awesome he is. And it's only natural. And this woman just simply does something very natural. She just simply shares her story. And she tells other people about Jesus. Everyone in this room who knows Jesus personally, you have the exact same story that you can tell. You can do this on the escalator at the Peachtree Mall. Here's how long it takes. This is who I was before I came to know Jesus Christ personally. This is what Jesus did for me, and he can do the same thing for you. It takes about 30 seconds to tell somebody what Jesus has done for you. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, it's a very powerful witness. Because as I said, no one can argue with your story. They may not believe it. They may not think he can do the same thing for me, but they can't look you in the eyes and say, yeah, that never happened to you. That's what makes your story so powerful. I'm going to try to wrap up today with a story. I may have told you all this already. I don't remember, but I'll tell you about a time that I was in Central America, in the country of Panama, going down there to do some training, and I was trying to become an expert on fighting in the jungles. I was a sergeant in the Ranger Regiment. This is a million years ago, and they sent us down to the country of Panama, me and a small team of rangers, to go down there and to learn how to fight on any battlefield anywhere in the world to include the jungle. So we went down to Panama to learn how to fight in the jungle. Here's what I learned down there. They got killer bees, and they got poison arrow frogs, and they got cutter ants, and they got the bushmaster snake. Everything in the jungle wants to kill you, not to mention the people that may be trying to kill you. And one of the things that we went down there to do is to learn how to walk through the jungles and how to fight in a triple canopy jungle. Well, there was a part of the map that everyone, even the local experts said, don't go in there, nobody goes in there. They call it impassable terrain, which means it's impossible to pass through that terrain. You know what happens when you tell six army rangers don't go into terrain like that because nobody goes in there? You know what they're going to do? Of course they're going to go in there, and of course they're going to try to see if they can make it through there. And you know what? The experts are right. Because this Mahinga swamp in the country of Panama is a mangrove swamp. And a mangrove swamp, in this case, is where the roots of the trees grow above ground, three or four feet above ground. And no human being goes through that kind of swamp. Here you have these six arrogant army rangers that decide we're going to try to move several hundred yards through this mangrove swamp. And we're hours into it right now, and we move a couple of yards, maybe 100 or 200 yards, and we are totally lost and in trouble. Now, I'm at, at this time, I'm the team radio telephone operator, and I got the radio, and our team leader says, uh, Jeff, we're in trouble. We're going to have to call back to our commander. This is a, so embarrassing. Rangers hate to do this. We're going to have to call back to the commander. We're going to have to tell him we're lost. And you know what everybody's going to say about us when they hear this, right? So stop what you're doing and put your radio into operation. Call the commander and tell them we're lost and tell them we need help. 
We've been walking for about three or four hours and never touched the ground. Six grown men with 100 pounds worth of lightweight equipment and never touched the ground because I've been walking on the roots of this mangrove swamp for hours. I call back to our commander and I say, uh, we're lost and we're in the Mahinga swamp and we're in trouble. And I could hear them on the other end of the radio saying, you went where? Why did you go in there? You're crazy. What were you thinking? The bottom line is, commander sends folks to come get us. And it takes a lot of people and a lot of time to get these six arrogant rangers out of the Mahinga swamp in Panama. Now, I want you to hear something. These are some of the best trained warriors on earth. We're carrying some of the greatest equipment available to man. In fact, we're carrying some prototype equipment that nobody else has access to. If a person or equipment can get you through that swamp, we would have made it through on our own. And we can't get through it on our own. So our commander has to send somebody in to get us and to bring us out. And I've been using language all day long today on purpose that your friend, your next door neighbor that doesn't know Jesus personally, they're stuck in the swamp of sin. And they can't get out on their own. And they need somebody who will go in there with them and help them find their way out. There's only one way out of this swamp of sin. It is through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And God is calling us all of us in this room who know him personally, to go to your next door neighbor. He's calling you to reach out to your coworker, to talk to your classmate, to the lady that you go to the gym with, to your hunting buddy, to whoever it is, and to share with them what Jesus has done for you. You don't have to memorize a program. Just simply tell them who you were before you found Christ, what he did for you, and how he can do the same thing for them. And if you'll be faithful, you can be part of the generation that finishes the mission of God in our lifetime. I'm going to challenge you in this room. I'm going to challenge everyone in our church today to take a next step, but a very specific next step. If you know Jesus Christ personally, I want you to look at that mobile app. I want you to look at the screens. I want you to look at this paper at number three on this list. Would you right now ask the Holy Spirit, to put three people's faces or three first names on your mind of somebody that you're not sure they really do know Jesus. You're not sure that they go to church anywhere. And would you ask the Holy Spirit to help you open your life up to them this year, sometime, somehow in the course of this year? My guess is you're probably thinking the same thing that I'm thinking right now. Jeff, I have a million and one things to do. And the last thing that I need to do is to add to my schedule another thing today. I'm not asking you to do something. I'm asking you to become a witness for Jesus by simply going through your day as you normally would and taking somebody with you, opening your life up to somebody who does not know Jesus and asking them, explaining to them, how Jesus can do for them what he's done for you. This doesn't need to take any more time if you will just grab a couple of people, one or two or three people who don't know Jesus and sometime during the course of 2018, open your heart, open your life up to them and invite them to come to know Jesus Christ personally as your savior, as their savior. If you do that, it may be the very thing that God uses to cause them to go through this miracle of new birth, to go from death to life. But can we be honest? Maybe some of us in this room would say, yeah, that middle one on the screen, that one pretty much uh, describes me. I've been sitting on and keeping secret the greatest news that human history has ever heard. And I really haven't been very faithful in sharing it with anybody. And maybe what you need today is somebody to pray with you or somebody to pray for you. In just a second, we're going to give you the chance to respond. I really hope somebody walked into the doors of this church that does not know Jesus personally. And today, the Holy Spirit is causing you to step across the line of faith and to trust Jesus as your Savior for the first time. I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to ask you to pray. And then after this prayer is over with, I'm going to invite you to respond. Not to me, 
not to this church. I'm going to invite you to respond to the Holy Spirit this morning. So would you bow your heads? And would you let me pray? Father, I pray for your people in this room first, those that know Jesus Christ personally. Somebody stepped into the swamp of their sin and explained to them how they can be a Christian. And God, would you cause them today, right now, would you put on their mind three faces, three names of somebody who needs to know Jesus personally. And I'm not asking them to do some program or to go do something different, but just simply to open their heart up and to take somebody along with them. And as they're opening their life and opening their heart up, share with them what Jesus has done for them. And Holy Spirit, I'm convinced if, our folk, if your people will do that, you will bless it and many lives will be changed because of it. But would you help us as a church to be praying for those folks? Would you help us as a church to know who those people are and to pray that this year, one or all three of those people will come to faith in Jesus? Maybe some of us in this room have been sitting on this message and haven't been sharing it faithfully lately. And God, you're causing us to be willing to open our lives up and to share it with somebody who needs to hear it. But Father, I really pray that, pray that somebody in this room steps across the line of faith and today surrenders their soul to Jesus. Maybe they do this right now in their seat, just between them and you in the quietness, the silence of their own heart. By simply praying, Jesus, I am a sinner. I realize it. I'm stuck in that swamp and I can't make it out on my own. And I believe that's why you left heaven and came to earth. I believe you went into that swamp to rescue me from my sins. You paid a death on the cross as payment for my sins. And today, right now, right here, Jesus, just between me and you, I'm surrendering it all to you. I am turning to you. I am trusting you as my Lord and my Savior for the first time, which means wherever you want me to go, whatever you ask me to do, I will do it. God, if that prayer is real, I know you hear it. I know you bless it, and I know that you will take somebody and turn them into a new person from the inside out. So, Father, would you be at work, and would you be glorified by the way that your people don't just hear from your word, but become doers of your word this week? I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.